time. So hopefully I can get this. Okay. Hopefully I can get this going here today. How's that? Okay. I think we're ready. Yep, I think so. I can see oh, it. I don't know what I've got going on here. Hang on. I love computers. <laughs> I think I know what's going to happen here. Just there we go. There we go. Okay. So. Well, welcome back. Uh, I appreciate you letting me off last Monday to go on my Father's Day fishing trip. And by the way, yes, I did catch some fish and I did catch the biggest. So, you know, I did have some success there. So I'll be honest with you. I'm really not for sure where we left off last time. So just to make sure that I've covered this, I'm gonna kind of repeat a little bit, I think. And, but today's topic is going to be primarily about the Hittites, uh, a little known group of people uh, that has talked about very little in the Bible. And frankly, that was all we knew about the Hittites until about the 20th century. And now we know quite a bit about them because of archaeological and historical finds. And uh, they did play a very important part in the ancient world and uh, conversely with, with the uh, Israelites. So uh, when we left off, Sargon II, I believe, was the king of Assyria, and he had been killed in battle, and his body had not been returned, which was a bad sign. That was a way of your enemy uh, basically telling uh, you that his body would be destroyed, and he would walk in eternity, uh, you know, uh, basically eating dust is what they said. Well, his the Assyrians assumed that this meant because Sargon II had done something bad. And so his son, who took charge after him, was a man by the name of Sennacherib. And Sennacherib spent almost his whole kingship denying his father, uh, trying to undo what his father Sargon II had done. Uh, the result was that he was involved in a tremendous amount of battles. Um, he was involved with the battle against the Babylonians. And most importantly for us, he was involved in a battle against Jerusalem. Probably one of the most documented battles in history sieges, re really. And it's just chronicled in detail, both in the book of Second Kings as well as Second Chronicles. So... Let's see a little bit about Sennacherib. And again, this may be a repeat. And if it is, I apologize. But uh, it's been so long since I've been able to uh, get some continuity going here. I've just about forgot where I was. Um, 689, he invades Babylon and he destroys the city. Um, he also builds a new capital of the Assyrians called Nineveh. Nineveh, of course, comes down to us today as being one of the, uh, you know, idolatrous cities of, of the Near East, and uh, it's mentioned almost right up there with Babylon as being uh, a symbol of everything that is bad. Um, apparently, the Babylonians had to be destroyed because when he went into the town, he refused to take the hand of their chief god, a god by the name of Marduk. They had a statue, and he was supposed to grab the the hand of the statue and pledge his allegiance to the Babylonians. He refused to do that. Uh, and the Babylonians revolted and he in turn took most of them prisoner, took the statue prisoner, actually took the statue back to the new capital of Nineveh and put it on trial before his God. And uh, Marduk, the Babylonian God was found guilty of grave offenses. Um, as it turned out, this was a really stupid thing for Sennacherib to do because uh, the people of Babylonia never forgave him. On top of that, the people of Assyria also kind of worshiped um, the same gods. And so a lot of them were felt like that they had done a really uh, impious thing here. 
So the next thing he does is Sennacherib turns his attention to the Levant. Remember the Levant is this place of, that we now call Israel, uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. Uh, no, we're not going to have good volume back though. Uh, these places here. So he turns his attention to the Levant and he, he ends up subduing Phoenicia and then he lays siege to Judah, the southern kingdom. Remember the northern kingdom has already been taken prisoner in what was known as the, uh, as, you know, one of the, uh, you know, dis diasporas. Uh, the first one, they had been taken prisoner in the city of Samaria had been basically destroyed by the Assyrians. So now he lays his siege to Judah and he demands tribute from the king of Judah who is located in Jerusalem, name is Hezekiah. Hezekiah uh, ends up paying him 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold, which it says in the Bible, 2 Kings 18, 13 through 16, that he actually stripped the temple of all the gold and silver and uh, basically destroyed uh, the temple that Solomon had built and took all the silver and gold out of it and give it to Sennacherib in hope that he would not invade Jerusalem. Well, it didn't work, okay? That only whetted the appetite of Sennacherib and so Sennacherib proceeds on to Jerusalem and he lays siege to the city. And again, this is really heavily documented in the Bible. And uh, you can go to Second Kings and uh, the 18th chapter and it talks a whole lot about this and, you know, and repeats it almost word for word in Second Chronicles. Um, this is the gates of Nineveh. This is uh, the historic gates that he built that led into his new city. By the way, these are no longer exist. Uh, in 2016, ISIS destroyed the gates of Nineveh. Uh, they have destroyed a whole lot of uh, the relics of not just the Christians, by, but other antique, you know, an, antique or antiquarian uh, civilizations. Uh, they destroyed the tomb of Jonah. Uh, they also destroyed uh, the gates of Azure. Uh, the capital of Assyria, they've just destroyed a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, antiquities. Uh, fortunately, uh, I think the world finally woke up and has them pretty much under control, and hopefully uh, they won't destroy too much more. Um, so, Sennacherib is at the gates of Jerusalem. Now, he sends a, a delegate to Jerusalem outside the gates and he tells the people you need to stop listening to your king Hezekiah is not doing what's in your best interest and if you don't surrender your city and this is a quote from the bible second kings 18 27 you're going to have to eat your own excrement and drink your own urine now that's pretty graphic but that's exactly how the Assyrians that was the kind of uh, thing they did and they said you know if you don't surrender to us when we take your city um, apart you know we're going to destroy you and we're going to we're going to you know absolutely embarrass you so Hezekiah of course is really he didn't know what to do so he consults Isaiah Isaiah is the prophet at this time in Jerusalem and he tells Sennacherib no stay the course Eventually, Sennacherib is going to be cut down by the sword in his own country. So Hezekiah is a faithful follower of God, and he says, fine. He offers a very long prayer to God, and uh, he you know, says in the Bible that God answered him with the denouncement of judgment on the Assyrian king. You can read it in 2 Kings 19, 14 through 34, and the Bible says in that night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Assyria and stayed there. Now, did that really happen? Well, apparently it did because Herodotus, the Greek historian who wrote sometime later, claimed that indeed Sennacherib's army was struck by a plague. And uh, he said it was struck by a plague of field mice. Well, we all know now, of course, that bubonic plague is carried by, you know, mice and rats and uh, 
that was a very common disease back in this time. And so it's very probable that, you know, Sennacherib's army was uh, destroyed by a plague. Uh, you can believe it took place because God sent it there, or I guess you cannot, but whatever, uh, it happened. Now, when Sennacherib got back in typical ancient history format, he failed to mention that he got his rear end kicked. All he does, he writes up a big prism, you know, a stone thing that records his victory, saying that I caged up Hezekiah like a caged bird in the royal city, completely disregarding the fact that his army basically got destroyed. Now, that didn't mean that the people around him didn't know what happened. They knew what happened. And so the result was that one day, according to the Bible, one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adremelech and Sherezer, I don't know if I'm saying those right, killed him with the sword and they escaped to the land of Ariok, which is north of Assyria, 2 Kings 19.37. So he in turn then is succeeded by a king known as Ezerhaddon. That was another one of his sons that took charge of his kingdom after his two brothers killed him. And this is a depiction of the siege of Jerusalem uh, that was left at, you know, by uh, Sennacherib. Now, I need to kind of stop here for a minute because again, I don't know if I told you this story or not, but it is so important. Remember, I'm, one of my goals is to try to put uh, historical credence to the Bible. I'm trying to show you that things that are said in the Bible really did take place. One of the things that's talked about in the Bible during the siege on Jerusalem was the fact that Hezekiah built a tunnel to bring water into the city. Now, for centuries after this, people debated this and they said, well, it really didn't happen. That was just something, that was another one of the made up stories of the Jews. You know, there's a group of people today that want to deny Jewish history. And they continue to, to basically try to do everything they can to cast dispersion upon the Old Testament. And they took this as one of those events. They said, no, it's just, this could not have happened. Well, sure enough, folks, in the late 1800s, a group of archaeologists began to unearth what they believed was the tunnel that is described in great detail in the Bible. And so we know now that there was indeed a tunnel built uh, basically from the Gihon Spring, which is outside the gates of Jerusalem overlooking the Kidron Valley. And this tunnel was built at, to bring water into the city. So if it was sieged by an outlying force that you know, the city would have water. And Hezekiah, recognizing that Sennacherib was probably going to do this, had this tunnel built. And we now have excavated it totally. I say we, archaeologists have. And they built this tunnel. And uh, it says in the Bible, as for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all of his achievements and how he made the pool and tunnel by which he brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah, 2 Kings 2020? So they have excavated this tunnel. Uh, you can't go into it because of uh, the historical importance of it and all, but we have photographs of it. And there's actually an inscription on the Southern exit of the tunnel inside the city. And it details the task of the, of the digging. This was written at the time into the stone at the time the tunnel was built. Uh, the tunnel is almost basically a third of a mile long. It's a, a, almost like a snake. It, it, it's not a straight tunnel. It curves in and out and it's several feet deep under the ground. Now, how they did this, folks, we still don't know because they started at one end and started at the other end, and they dug until they met in the middle. How they were able to do this is beyond comprehension. We could do it today, obviously, with all of our technology and all. But you know, we're talking basically uh, 
2,700 years ago. How they were able to do this has not really been understood to this day. But here's the inscription. It says, when there were still three cubits, about four and a half feet to be excavated, there were the sounds of a man calling to his companion. On the day of the completed excavation, the stone hewers struck out, each towards the opposite number, pick towards pick. And they completed the tunnel. Folks, I'm telling you, this is one of the most historically important finds in biblical archaeology, because you know this is one of those things that people just denied had happened for centuries, and they said it was just part of the Hebrew mythology. Well, when they found this thing a hundred years ago or so, and it, it took a long time to excavate it, they now have the tunnel excavated. This is the photograph of Hezekiah's tunnel that brought water into the city during the siege of Sennacherib. And I can't tell you the importance of this. Some people say other than the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this may be the most important biblically archeological find of ever, you know, because it, it gives so much credence to the Bible as a historical document. So that's enough about the Assyrians. I wanted to get going today on the Hittites and hopefully I'll get done with them. The Hittites are a group of people that we knew almost nothing about until the 20th century. Um, they were mentioned in the Bible just a little bit, and frankly, that's all we knew by them. Uh, other than what they were mentioned in the Bible, they were just one of these groups of people that were basically lost to history. By the way, this is the entrance, this is the gates, uh, the ruins of the gates to Hattusas. Hattusas was the capital of the Hittites and located in what we now know as Turkey, called the Anatolia Peninsula. I've got a little cartoon. I uh, thought I might bring a little humor to you. I see your little petrified skull, it says, labeled and resting on the shelf somewhere. Uh, I thought that was pretty humorous, you know, kind of gives us a, an idea again of some of the, you know, humor of the cartoon. I, I like artwork and I thought I'd do cartoons this year. So here's a Bible verse to start on the Hittites. And it says, then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am a foreigner and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. Genesis 23, three through five. Uh, this happened in the city of what we now call Hebron. Hebron's about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. Uh, it was the middle, basically, of the desert at that time. And Abraham's wife, Sarah, had died. And he pled for a place to bury his wife. And so they sold him a cave, it says. And it was sold to him by Hittites. That is one of the, that's the first mention of the Hittites anywhere in history. And there's only a few other mentions of him. And I'll, talk, I'll recite those here in just a moment. By the way, what you see in the background there is the uh, tomb of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Facing them is another tomb of their wives, Sarah, Leah, and Rachel. And uh, so the six patriarchs, this is called the Cave of the Patriarchs. There's a church that's built over it. And uh, the bodies of those three patriarchs is supposed to reside in there and their wives on an opposite tomb from it. Uh, it's one of the most, it's one of the holiest sites in the world. In fact, in case the Jewish people think that next to the Temple Mount, uh, this is the holiest site in their religion. It's one of the holiest sites in our religion, the Christian religion, as well as one of the holiest sites to the Islamic religion, because they also view uh, Abraham as their patriarch, as you know, the starting of their lineage. So, how did we discover the Hittites? Well. Like I said, we know them primarily from the Bible. Uh, here's uh, what the Bible says about them. Hang on here so I can move this over a little bit. It said, uh, prior to the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, the Hittites were a little known group of Indo-European people who populated the Anatolian Peninsula, Turkey, around 1680 BC. So this would have been about the time that the Jews 
were beginning to be oppressed by the Egyptians. What little we knew of them was gleaned from the Old Testament. In Genesis 23, Ephron the Hittite sells Abraham the family burial plot. We just mentioned that. In another verse, Genesis 26, 34, Esau marries a Hittite woman. Um, and Isaac and Rebekah don't care much for it. Um, and they are frequently listed as one of the inhabitants of Canaan in Exodus 13, 5, and in Numbers in Joshua. And, of course, famously, King David had amongst his uh, warriors Uriah the Hittite, uh, who he had killed because he desired to bed his wife Bathsheba. This is talked about in 2 Samuel 11. Of course, this was the ultimate sin to David that he had to live with the rest of his life. Solomon also had Hittites among his many wives, mentioned in 2 King, 1 Kings. And Ezekiel actually uses the Hittites as a metaphor um, to basically um, uh, kind of degrade Israel in Ezekiel 16, 3 uh, and 45. So the first archaeological discoveries about the Hittites were made about the late 1800s. Uh, man by the name of William Wright, who is one of the founders of, of the biblical archaeological movement, uh, was uh, excavating a site known as Hattusis. Uh, but finally, it wasn't until about the early 1900s that we were able um, to basically understand what he found. He found over 10,000 tablets ascribed in the Akkadian cuneiform. And when they were able to decipher this and they were able to read them because they were written in Akkadian, the language that we could read, it just opened up the door to, uh, to the, uh, basically opened up the door to the Hittite history. Because before that, we had no idea uh, really uh, that much about the Hittites. So at that point in time, archeo another archeologist, Archibald Sayas said that pronounced that the Hittite empire was the rival of the Egyptian, the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires at its height. So all of a sudden we have an empire here that was basically lost to history is now uh, thrown open to us. And we realized this was a huge empire that had a whole lot of influence. And we begin to realize the scope of it and the part it played in ancient history. Uh, further discoveries at Carchemish, another very important Hittite city by Leonard Woolley, the same guy that founded Ur, uh, and a man by the name of T.E. Lawrence, who you might know by a better name, Lawrence of Arabia. I'm sure a lot of you have remember seeing this movie in the early 60s, uh, one of the great movies that were made, one of those epics about uh, that involved uh, Arabia. And in 1900s, this excavation of Carchemish by these two just led to, you know, more interpretation of the power of the Hittites in the ancient world. This is a photograph of Woolley to your right, and that is Lawrence of Arabia, a very young man who had his early training as a archaeologist and later on went on to be a, a great basically a, a guerrilla fighter with the Arab armies, you know, against the Ottoman Empire. So where did the Hittites come from? Well, what we think is that they came into what we now know as Turkey about 2000 BC after they left the area probably up around the Black Sea known as the Ukraine today. So they're actually Indo-Europeans. The Hittites were probably look more like us than you know, the typical uh, people that we associate with uh, the Middle East. They were actually more Indo-European looking and uh, more Ukrainian looking than they, they look like the typical Middle Eastern people. They spoke an Indo-European language and they rapidly imposed their will on the existing peoples of the Anatolia Peninsula, which at that time was a group of people called the Hurrians. And uh, the first king that we know of was a man by the name of Hattusli I, and he established the Hittite capital of Hattusa, and by 1650, uh, he had all, we had progressed all the way down into Syria. So the Hittites, we now know through these records that we're able to read, 
um, very rapidly gained control of all of the Anatolia Peninsula, Turkey, and began to proceed down south. That's where they got into conflict with the Babylonians, who were ruling Mesopotamia then, and in particularly the Egyptians. Um, they became the big rival of the Egyptians when the Egyptians kind of resurrected themselves after uh, being basically torn apart by a group of people known as the Hyksos. They kicked out the Israelis, the Jews, and uh, during the Exodus and the Jewish people had wandered around as we know in the Sinai Peninsula and then they'd settled in the land of Canaan. Um, this was all going on at the same time. Um, what followed then after the basically a, taking over the Anatolian Peninsula was a 500 year pattern of expansion under uh, strong kings and contraction under weaker ones. The Hittites were never strong in this whole period of time. They would rise and fall. Part of it was because the kingship of the Hittites was not looked upon as a living God like the Pharaohs of Egypt or Assyria or Babylonia. You know, these kings became living gods in the eyes of their people. The Hittites weren't like this. The Hittites didn't believe that their kings were gods. They thought they were just a little bit more important than, than the common man, but they were still humans. Um, so here is the Hittite empire. You can see this in the dark brown here is the, basically the furthest extent of the Hittite empire. And you can see that they are coming in conflict with both the Assyrian for a while and then with the Babylonian empire in the Mesopotamian river valley, as well as Egypt. And they really come into conflict with Egypt uh, as we're gonna see. And they had a huge battle in Egypt with Egypt. Uh, probably their greatest king was a man by the name of Supalaluma. I know you have to be just terribly impressed that I can say these names. I'm just laughing at myself. I don't know if I'm saying them right or not. I'm telling you their names according to the way that I was taught as a young student. And somehow I do remember how they were pronounced. I don't know if they're pronounced correctly or not. But uh, he is most remembered as challenging the dominant Egyptian control of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, in Egypt, uh, about this time that he was of the king of the Hittites, there was a very weak king known as Akhenaten. And Akhenaten had basically thrown over the old system in Egypt. And uh, he had kind of torn Egypt apart during his reign. And he didn't reign very long. And, you know, the problem was that when he, he just ignored all their foreign possessions, the Hittites took advantage of this to gain control of basically the Levant. Uh, when he died, his uh, kingship, the Pharaoh's ship, was taken over by a very young boy by the name of Tutankhamun. You're going to hear a lot more about Akhenaten and Tutankhamun later on. Uh, of course, this is the famous King Tut, who we now know by his discovery of his tomb, which we're going to see and, and hear a lot about in a month or so. Uh, well, Tutankhamun didn't live very long, and uh, his wife uh, wanted to remarry because she had to have an heir to the throne, and she didn't have any boys. So she sent a letter to Supalamula asking him to send her one of his sons, said, if you will send me one of your sons, I will marry him and make him the Pharaoh of Egypt, and you know we can unite our two kingdoms. Well, he did this. He actually sent his son down to marry the widow of, T of King Tut, but unfortunately he was intercepted on the way by Tut's kind of uh, chief of staff, a man by the name of I, and I had him killed because he wanted to be the Pharaoh of Egypt, and indeed he became the Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, big long story, which we'll talk a lot more about. Well, Supalabiluma then was livid at this. He had visions of being part of the Egyptian empire, taking it over. And rather than sit idly by watching one of his sons die, which probably didn't matter to him, I'll be very honest, uh, he decided that he was going to absolutely go on a war here 
and he was going to attack the Egyptians. And he did this, uh, took many prisoners amongst the Egyptians in the Levant. Uh, unfortunately for Suplamuma, uh, he didn't live very long because they got the plague and died. So this is Suplamuma, Lulamash. Uh, he's the, the greatest of the Hittite kings. Um, this is all we have of him. This is the only way we know him is by this statue. Kind of a weird looking dude, to say the least. I'm, I'm not for sure if they just didn't have that good of artistic uh, ability or what here. So we know now that the Hittites were great warriors. In fact, the case, there was a period of time in the age history that the Hittites had the most important war machine of the whole Bible. Uh, this was in no small part because they had been able to capture the idea of how to make iron. Now, let's stop here for a second. Up to this point in time, most of ancient history, that written history was called the Bronze Age because the ore that was the typical ore and metal that where they made weapons out of was bronze. Uh, and basically the Hittites figured out how to extract iron from ore. People had known how to do this, but they couldn't get it done. Uh, they had accidentally done it in different ways, but they just really didn't have a, a real foolproof method for making iron weapons. Iron was so much stronger than bronze. And anybody who had iron weapons had a distinct advantage on the battlefield. Well, the Hittites are the first people to basically systematically learn how to make iron weapons. And it gave them such an important uh, advantage on the battlefield. And so this is what basically made their war machine and, and the weapons, you know, bronze weapons are kind of brittle and an iron sword against a bronze sword, there was no, there was no chance. Uh, the iron sword would just completely break and decimate the bronze sword. And the result was that the Hittites were able to basically gain control over much of the known uh, world at that time because they had such an advantage they also were the first ones to use the chariot in, in this way. They built the chariot to hold three soldiers. Now, chariots had been around for a while, but they were basically either one-man chariots or the Egyptians had kind of perfected them in using a driver and a fighter. Well, the Hittites made big chariots and they had a driver and they had a man with a huge shield that, which would protect not only the driver, but the, but the fighter. And he would hold the shield up and then the person behind the shield would be able to, to wield his sword. And they end up having a really strong advantage because they basically perfected the chariot. On top of that, the Hittites were just, they were a warrior society, much like the Assyrians had been. And they built what was called professional armies. They're, you know, the soldiers, of ancient history, a lot of times were just farmers who were called up to fight for the Pharaoh or the king or whoever. The Hittites actually had an army of soldiers. That, that was their full-time job. Their job was to go out and fight. And they trained, they learned new weapons, they used better weapons, they had more tactics and strategy. And the result was that really, until the Assyrians adopted their own technology, there was nobody any better than the Hittites at fighting in the ancient world. And again, folks, we knew almost none of this prior to the excavation of these sites and, and unearthing all these tablets, which gave us an insight into the Hittite empire. Uh, so this is a relatively new uh, finding for historians. Uh, this is a picture of some of the iron weapons that they would have used. This is in one of the iron foundries, which they obviously reconstructed, uh, which the Hittites <clears throat> were able to forge their weapons. They had to heat the ore in a really high, intense heat to be able to extract the iron from the iron ore. And nobody had been able to figure out how to do this prior to the Hittites. Uh, they also had a very unusual idea about government. 
Remember I told you that their kings were not gods. And they felt like they needed the kings needed to have a little bit of control over them. So they actually had what we would basically call a constitutional monarchy. Uh, they had a king, but there were people that kind of had limits on his authority. So while the supreme ruler who was in charge of the military and the judici judiciary and where some of the high priests, some of these, some of these officials actually operated independently of the king. For instance, there was a chief of the royal bodyguards who was not controlled by the king. I'm not sure if that's a good idea, but that's the way it was in the Hittites. They also had a chief of the wine stewards who was not controlled by the king. You might say big deal. Folks, it was a big deal because one of the ways that your enemies often got rid of you in the ancient world was poisoning you. And uh, the wine steward was a very important person. He controlled what basically the king ate and drank. And then, of course, the chief of the scribes, uh, the writers, the people who recorded the history of the monarch. And again, this was important because if you want to go down in history as a great king, you better have this guy on your, on your right-hand man here. Uh, the result was that there were some controls upon the king of the Hittites, something we had not seen and really didn't see again for some time. This was one of the first attempts to kind of control a king as such. He also had an advisory council known as a Pancus. And this kind of like a, a, a governor, like a Congress. Uh, they basically set up rules and regulations for the citizens, not for the king. You know, the king was bound by their rules, but at least there were rules on the citizens and they were kind of a, tolerant. For instance, in the ancient world, most times if you committed certain crimes like murder or theft, you were just killed. Well, the Hittites said, well, that's kind of gone overboard. It depends on who you are. We might let you involved with restitution, give you money instead to pay off, uh, to pay the, the worst of the subject. So um, the Hittite religion was also very important, heavily influenced by the Mesopotamian religion, but you can begin to see some European elements in it. Uh, for instance, the storm god uh, was one of the most important gods to the Hittites. Uh, a uh, god by the name of Tarhunt. Uh, he was represented by a bull. The bull is one of those big symbols that you see all through ancient history. And this is a uh, one of the sculptures of their god, Tarhunt, uh, the bull god, the storm god. Well, I want to finish with the Hittites with the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, the Battle of Kadesh may very well be the most documented ancient history battle uh, that we know of. It happened in 1274. We know the date. Uh, what happened was this. As I told you, the Egyptians had kind of reinvigorated themselves after they had kicked out a bunch of invaders, including the Jews. Uh, they kicked them out basically after, you know, the Bible says after a, a series of plagues under Moses' leadership, and he basically told them to get out. I don't want to see you anymore. And we know the story from the Ten, Ten Commandments and all like this. Well, the Egyptians had reinvigorated their empire into what we now know as the new empire under very strong pharaohs. And they had regained most of the lost territories and they came into conflict with the Assyrians for a while, but now they're in conflict with the Hittites. And sure enough, in 1274, Ramesses II, uh, we all have heard of Ramesses II. If you've ever watched the movie, The Ten Commandments, he is the uh, Pharaoh portrayed in the movie, The Ten Commandments, that uh, Moses basically uh, wages his war of plagues against. Uh, I think you're going to find out that probably wasn't the case. Uh, Ramesses probably wasn't that Pharaoh, but we'll get into that later. Uh, anyway, Ramesses II was nevertheless an extremely strong Pharaoh, and he decides to march north and he met up with the Hittite king, a man by the name of Muwalatili. 
who had found uh, support amongst a bunch of the allies to resist the Egyptians. Everybody wanted to get rid of the Egyptians because they were kind of a, the big dog, you know, and they wanted to get rid of them now. So they arrive and meet each other in an area we now know as Lebanon at the city of Kadesh. Uh, it's near Aleppo and Syria. And they meet in the Arantes River Valley in a little town called Kadesh. And they have a huge battle. And this battle is highly documented, not just from the Hittites point of view, but from the, from the Egyptian point of view. Uh, it's recorded in vast detail, and I'm not anywhere near going to go into the detail of the battle. I'll just let you know a couple of things about it. Uh, there was attacks and counterattacks, uh, and apparently at one point in time, uh, the Hittites had routed the Egyptian army, and instead of following up on their advantage, they stopped to plunder the abandoned uh, troops and, and all the stuff materials they left behind, Ramesses in turn counterattacks, chases the Hittite chariots back across the valley, the Rantes Valley, and they continue a back and forth charge until finally the Hittites are forced to leave the battlefield. Now, did they win the battle or did the Egyptians win the battle? Uh, that's not really important to us. Um, I will tell you that basically Egyptians say they won the battle, and the Hittites never really admit that, but it's a huge battle. It's also the largest chariot battle ever fought in history. There's an estimated five to 6,000 chariots involved in this battle, folks. We're talking hundreds of thousands of men uh, fighting on the battlefield. And this, you know, this would have been a gruesome sight to see. I mean, these battles were not antiseptic by any means at all. Uh, Today, you know, we fight with technology and uh, basically battles are fought long distance, except occasionally you end up fighting man to man. Not so back in these days. Um, can you imagine 6,000 chariots uh, fighting each other? Thousands, hundreds of thousands of men with swords and spears and shields, the amount of bloodshed involved, the horses that were being, I mean, it was it just been a huge, battle, you know, and a massive battle and a massive loss of life. The result was very important to both the Egyptians and the Hittites. The Egyptians, by claiming the advantage of the victory, was able to take control and keep control of what we now know as the Levant. The Hittites were so beaten back, even though they really weren't defeated per se, that they basically begin to crumble. And the Assyrians, who were just kind of waiting back in the background, kind of drooling because they had been the big dog in the Mesopotamian River Valley, and now they were coming back. And the Assyrians saw what happened, and they basically rushed in and finished off the Hittites. And the result was that the Battle of Kadesh ended up killing off the Hittite Empire. So this is the Hittites. Um, a very important part of the biblical world, uh, one that we don't hear much about in the Bible, because frankly, um, while this was going on, Joshua was, was fighting his way through Canaan, uh, trying to establish control of Canaan as the Jewish homeland. Uh, so that's one reason we don't hear much about it, because they were preoccupied fighting the Canaanites, um, trying to gain control of what the Bible says was the chosen land. So the last king of the Hittites was Supalulamach II, uh, and he was basically destroyed, and the Hittite empire falls into the ash can of history, as so, until the 20th century. And this is a part of a hieroglyphic in, a depiction of the Battle of Kadesh left by the Egyptians, we knew they had this battle, but we really didn't know exactly who it was against until we were able to find out later. So next week, I hate to tell you this, but because it's the 4th of July, uh, I know a lot of the places have things going on on the 4th and over the holidays. So I'm going to take another week off. I don't really want to, but after that, we're going to come back and hopefully until we get to Labor Day, 
uh, we're going to be able to get to some constancy and some consistency. When I come back two weeks from today, we're going to talk about the Babylonians. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you've all heard of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, in the Bible. And we're going to talk about the Babylonian kings and their influence upon the biblical world. So I appreciate you guys being with me today. I hope you've learned something. And, uh, you know, I will see you in two weeks and we'll talk about old King Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Kalen. <laughs> you have a good afternoon. We'll see you next week. Okay, we'll see you in two weeks. Oh, two weeks. Yes, I forgot. It's already yeah, the holiday I, next I, weekend. I, I was afraid there was going to be several of the places that have events on the Monday following the 4th, so I thought it might be a good time to take another break. I'm not, I'm ready to talk, but I think probably uh, be the best thing. You know, no, I mean, we will see you. Going, so we will come back in two weeks and then hopefully I'll be with you until Labor Day. Awesome. Yeah, we'll see you in two weeks, Tony. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.